Hello everybody, this is Alex, also known as Solanus Dracone, and welcome back to my Pern Primer series. When last we left off, the colonists of the new planet Pern were facing a disaster. The perfect world they had thought they found turned out to be the unfortunate bystander in a solar system-wide drive-by, which repeated every 250 years. Thread fell almost unchecked upon the populace destroying and devouring crops, livestock, and people. The leaders of the colony had to call for an emergency centralization in order to help preserve, protect, and feed the sadly dwindling population. At their wit's end, the leaders went to consult with the galaxy's best human geneticist, Madam Kit Ping Young. You see, Pern was obviously not a world devoid of all life. Far from it, it teemed with life. One life form in particular had very much caught the people's notice. A strange little breed of critter, which greatly resembled the ancient dragons of earthen legend, dubbed dragonettes by the colonists. These little guys were about the size of a cat at full growth, and if they chewed and swallowed a special type of phosphine-bearing rock, they could even belch fire. They also had the amazing ability to actually teleport from any place on the face of the planet to any other place in 8 seconds or less, much less the closer it was. These creatures, also called fire lizards by a few irreverent individuals, which, because it's what they were exclusively called by the point of the ninth pass, I am going to call them from now on, were also highly empathic creatures. They communicated through telepathic means, and what was most impressive to them was the fact that the little creatures, just upon hatching, were actually impressionable, just like ducklings in real life. If a person happened to be there when the fire lizard hatched and fed it, and sent generally soothing warm thoughts its way, it would forever bond with that person on a deep mental and emotional level. At first, they were just amusing and oftentimes useful pets for many of the settlers, and served many functions that traditionally other types of pets like cats and dogs would have, chasing away vermin and so forth. These fire lizards, with their ability to teleport and to breathe fire, and their susceptibility to training, were also good in many cases for helping protect stranded people and livestock during threadfall. They could teleport out of the way of the falling menace and burn it, and obviously from the instincts they had developed over their evolution, they innately knew how to handle the falling menace. Mind you, they were at best as intelligent as toddlers. They didn't have the mental capacity to think very much, only to feel emotions and respond. The colony leaders saw this and thought how awesome it would be if these were bigger and more intelligent. That is what they brought forth to Kit Ping Young. Young agreed to undertake this project, and through the magic of science, she was able to create much larger versions of the fire lizards, proper dragons. These dragons would have a higher level of intelligence than the fire lizards they were modeled after, and much more importantly, were able to discharge much more flame and stay in the air for longer. They would be paired the same as before with individual human partners, but the link would be much deeper. They would be able to think in words, communicating very clearly with their riders, and able to process a whole lot more information during the hectic frenzy of Threadfall. Their mental capacity was upgraded to pre-adolescent as opposed to just post-infant, so to speak. Now, I should take this opportunity to explain the dragons to you all, because that's what this whole series is really about. This information mostly applies to fire lizards and dragons, as they were almost perfectly identical, except for their size and their intelligence. Dragons come in five colors, each color being a result more or less defined by their individual genetics. Each color stayed generally within a strict size and intelligence range, with the smaller ones being less intelligent, and the larger ones being more so. First are the golden dragons, the queens, always female. These were the top of the hierarchy in dragon colors. They possessed the greatest size and intelligence, and were the ones who propagated the species. Queen dragons only ever paired with women. Queen dragons also didn't breathe fire. 
Second, the bronzes. Always male, only ever paired with men. Bronzes were just a little bit smaller, but they were the ones who mostly mated with the queens. Third, the browns. I know, it seems weird to draw a difference between brown and bronze, but the browns were, I suppose, kind of lighter in color and likely didn't have as much of a shine to their scales, so I guess it makes sense. Browns were always male, and only ever paired with men in Pern's history, but the men they paired with, while mostly of a heterosexual variety, could often be bisexual as well. Browns could mate with queens, but it wasn't very common, mainly because of the fact that the bronzes were bigger and could last longer in a mating flight. Fourth, the blues. Blues were always male, and they never mated with the queens. They were just too small to manage it. Blues almost always paired with men, but there are a couple extremely rare cases in Pern's history where they could pair with a woman. Their writers had a bit more of a tendency to be sexually open-minded. Finally, the greens, always female. The greens were actually capable of laying eggs, and these eggs hatching, but because greens weren't very intelligent, they didn't take very good care of their nests, and if the eggs hatched at all, they were almost certain to be more greens or blues at best. Also, at least in the dragons, the chewing of the rock which came to be called Firestone tended to render the greens completely infertile. Greens mostly paired with men, although women weren't unheard of as being capable of pairing with them too. In the latter years of the planet's history, it was basically unheard of for any dragon rider except for a gold rider to be a lady, but it was a bit more common than with blues. The riders of the green dragons, while not technically necessarily gay, tended to either be gay or bisexual to the point that if you saw a green rider, you couldn't really be sure, and so many people just kind of assumed if you rode a green, there was a good chance he might be gay or bi. In addition to the color-based dimorphism, there is some extra information that is good to get across about the dragons. 1. Golds didn't go infertile from chewing Firestone. They just vomited it back up. Because of this, the riders stopped giving Firestone to them. Over the millennia, dragon riders just generally came to forget this fact and assumed you didn't feed a gold dragon Firestone because it would make them infertile. That's another thing I love about this series. It acknowledges how the truth can be forgotten over a period of so many centuries and incorrect information become common knowledge just through custom. Number two, all dragon names ended with TH. Ramoth, Nemeth, Ruth, Beth, Hath, etc. It was just a thing. Each dragon was born knowing its own name and told it to the writer upon impression. Mark that word, impression, because I'm going to be using it from now on. Impression, or impressing, or being impressed, means that the dragon and writer have bonded. That's all it means. Number three, while a dragon and writer, once impressed, remain together for life, there was absolutely no limit on how many fire lizards a person could impress. Fire lizards were given names by their owners, because again, they didn't have any more intelligence than a toddler. And anybody from dragon riders to just the average common folk could impress a fire lizard. Number four, the act of draconic teleportation came to be called going between. When the first riders took their dragons between, they discovered that the eight seconds or so was spent in a sort of alternate dimension devoid of all sensation. This dimension was what was called between. Between was incredibly cold colder than anything, and the rider, since they could lose all sense of reality within there if they didn't know what to expect, could potentially panic. Going between was risky business, as it involved forming a strong mental picture of your destination for both rider and dragon. Even the tiniest bit of panic or loss of focus on the mental picture could result in a dragon and rider staying between forever, thusly dying. Number five, the bond between dragons and riders was incredibly deep, deeper than any other relationship it was possible for a person to have. Their souls, or psychic imprints, or whatever you wanted to call it, were practically welded together. 
This meant that if a dragon or a rider died without the other, it would be an incredibly traumatic event for either of them. Effectively always, except in extremely amazingly rare circumstances, if the rider died, the dragon would immediately suicide by jumping between and staying there. The only generally expected time that this would not happen is if it were a queen, and they had a clutch of eggs which had not hatched yet. But once those eggs did hatch, the dragon would immediately go between forever. For writers, they often decided to suicide as well in one way or another. It was literally impossible for an ex-dragon rider to ever be normal again. A part of their souls had literally left them forever when their dragon died. They would be forever haunted by it, and it was a rare circumstance for any ex-dragon rider who did keep on living to continue being a functioning member of society. It was such an accepted fact of life that another rider and dragon would often help with the suicide if it was desired, taking the unfortunate ex-rider between and dropping them there. Anyhow, back to the story. Even as these dragons were hatching, another problem faced the colonists. Their initial settlement, called Landing, which was the largest settlement on the planet and where all the centralization mostly occurred, was in a pretty dangerous area, geographically speaking. There was a volcanic fault line right underneath it, and the coming of the Red Star, which was the name given over time to the wandering planet, would often agitate things volcanically due to gravity effects and so on. And one of the volcanoes, right on top of their heads was about to blow. And that's all for this week, folks. I want to thank you all again for watching. Once again, I am Alex, also known as Solonist Raccoon, and this has been episode three of my Pern Primer series. Goodbye.